Good morning and welcome to Burke's Worship Online. My name is Beth Sullivan and I'm one of the pastors here and I'm excited that you're able to join us this Palm Sunday morning. This is the kickoff to Holy Week and so I wanna make sure that you are aware of the services that we'll be having for the rest of this week. First, we will have the Monday Thursday service at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. And then on Friday, Good Friday, we'll have a service at 12.15 here in the sanctuary. And then on the sunrise service, we're gonna be doing something a little bit different. And we will be meeting at the Harbor Lights Marina at 6.45. Now, there will be um, signs and people to follow in. It's also where they have Lake Church in the summer, so if you're familiar with that, you know where it is. But if you're not sure about all of that, you can put Zoe's Restaurant, so that's Zoe with an I, in your GPS, and it should take you right to where you'll see us gathering that morning. So we want to invite you to come be a part of that. And then we will have the 10 o'clock Sunday morning service here in the sanctuary, and there will be lots of good music. Mickey has something really special for us planned that morning. And then we will also be having our confirmation service that morning. So it's a very exciting service to be having for each Easter morning. So I invite you to come and be a part of that. But right now, in this time, we're here to worship. And so I invite you to join me in this call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever.
if you will join me now in this confession and pardon. Lord Jesus, we are fickle people, quick to turn away. We are quick to flock to you when all is well, but we are prone to scatter when there is opposition or criticism. Too often we have kept silent before you, afraid to proclaim your praise. It is easy to join the crowd as you ride triumphantly into Jerusalem, singing our joys and expectations, dancing our hopes and dreams. It is far more difficult to stand by you as the crowd cries for your crucifixion. Forgive our weakness when we turn away. Strengthen us for the journey ahead as we relive your suffering and death that we might be, stay beside you to the end. Give us the courage to shout our hosannas, not only today, but each and every day. Amen. Let us pray. The Lord is our strength and might. Jesus is our salvation. In Jesus, our sins are forgiven. In Jesus, our cries are answered. Our salvation is at hand. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At this time of offering, I want to let you know something about an announcement that was made last week in church. As you know, in the Methodist system, pastors move around, and this has been the season where those decisions are made. And the decision this year has been made by the bishop and the cabinet that I will be moving away from Berks up to Johnson City to serve at Muncie Memorial United Methodist. And I know that some of you are sad, some of you are shocked, some of you don't know what it means to be moving in the Methodist system, but I assure you this, it will be okay. In fact, it may even be great, because one of the best things about the United Methodist system is that there are always fresh eyes and voices available to help lead in the church. And so I hope that the things that come from this change, while change is hard, bring good things here. And the other beautiful thing about this system is this. I'm not your church. I'm a pastor at this church. But this church, through the offerings that we give here today, is active in this community. And they are supportive of each other, and they share their love through their giving and their presence and their gifts and their service in this community. And while it has been a pleasure to serve here, and we still have a couple of months of work to do together, I want to let you know that I know the work isn't me. It's you through these gifts. And it's an awesome thing to see here. And so I wanted to say to you, thank you. Thank you for all we've done here, for all that we will do in the next few months, and for all that you give here to make the work of this church possible. Let us pray. God, I thank you for all that we have. And I pray that as we give here today, that it will not be just something we do frivolously or because we might feel like we have to, but because we know that the work of this church in meeting the needs of this community is valuable. And we pray that all that we give here will be blessed and multiplied and used for your good. We ask this in your name. Amen.
join together in prayer. Oh, holy God, I, I thank you for your presence here today. I thank you for being with us as we come to worship you and to remember the stories of your love for us. I pray, Lord, that you would help us as we uh, live in this world together to feel your presence and feel your love drawing us together as a community, as a church, as families, even as a nation and as a world. Our hearts were stunned by some of the things that happened in Ukraine this week the story of the people trying to escape to a safer place in the eastern part of the country who were hit by a missile at a railway station. The stories of atrocities that were done near Kyiv and in other places throughout the country are just startling to us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would find a way to make this stop. We pray for those leaders all around the world who are trying to find answers to the, this violence that is happening. And we pray that you would help them to find an answer that doesn't bring more violence and more violence after that and even more but instead will find, help us to find peace together. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the needs of our church, not just Burke's United Methodist Church, and not just the United Methodist Church, but churches throughout the world who need to be lifted up once again by your Holy Spirit and sent out into the world to bring the good news of your love to all people. Give us courage and strength and, and, and give us the ability to say, yes, I can do that, so that others might be lifted up as well. And Heavenly Father, I, I think at this time of the year, and it, most times of the year about those who uh, do not have a safe place to be, whether they're here in our own community or they're someplace around the world. And I, I pray during this quiet period of, of COVID in our country that, that you would help us to have an understanding of all the, the damage that's been done throughout the world. I heard people debating this last week about why there weren't more deaths in Africa, especially in South Sudan. And they were going back and forth about all these different theories, and it suddenly occurred to me that their life expectancy is already just 44 years old. They don't get this disease as much, or it doesn't kill them because they're all very young to start with. And yet it has spread rapidly throughout South Sudan and throughout other countries in Africa and places all over the world. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to find answers to that as well. We don't know the answers but we pray that you would help us to find them as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and for, forgive those who try... Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise for the reading of today's Gospel lesson, found in Luke chapter 23, verses 1 through 49. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priest and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said he stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee where he began even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been wanting to see him for a long time because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priest and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Even Herod, with his soldiers treating him with contempt and mocked him, then he put an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate then called together the chief priests and leaders and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people, and here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and released him. Then they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow! Release Barabbas for us! This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. And they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they wished. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breast and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. 
But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of commendation. And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breast. But all of his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Wonderful counsel. 
My name is Tony Collins, and I'm one of the pastors here at Berkshire United Methodist Church. And here we are on Palm Sunday. I've heard somebody refer to Palm Sunday as a false Easter, uh, sort of like some people refer to false spring. You know, that time when it's been 60 or 70, maybe almost 80 degrees, and, and everything was beautiful and beginning to bud out, and, and there were blossoms on some of your plants and a, a strong, warm breeze from the south. And suddenly there are nurseries popping up all over with people with plants of various kinds, bedding plants and vegetable plants and all kinds of hanging baskets. And you just want to go out and, and buy them all right away because you want spring to be there so quickly. And suddenly, some sort of front comes down out of Canada and it, it brings cold air, brisk air, and the temperatures drop down into the 20s, maybe even the low 20s for a day or two, and, and they don't get up above 50 during the day, and then suddenly you find that it's spitting snow outside in April. It's not supposed to do that in Tennessee. It's not Easter. We read this story today, and we read about um, the fact that there was a celebration going on on this Palm Sunday. There were, there were people coming in with Jesus, and, and they weren't an army of people, and he wasn't on a stallion like we might expect. But here they came into the city and they were shouting Hosanna and, and we do that here too. I love the children's song that we learned a few years ago uh, about Hosanna and the way that they sing it with such enthusiasm. And we sing some great hymns and, and we're gonna sing one as we leave on Sunday morning. And yet, it's not Easter. On the other side of town, maybe even on the same day that Jesus was coming in with this crowd of ragtag people with their palm branches and their, their coats on the ground, the Roman soldiers are arriving from Caesarea Philippi while the king comes in to celebrate the Passover just like Jesus. But they come with hundreds of people and, and lots of armor and lots of weapons. And it reminds us it's not Easter. We sing our grand songs on this Sunday, but then it's Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and a, a cold wind seems to blow into our lives as the darkness of the world fills us again. It's about that time that, that out of the centers of power in Jerusalem and maybe Washington and Moscow and someplace else in the world, even in the centers of, of the church, we hear all kinds of dark deep things. The plot thickens in the world and we're not sure if we can get along with each other, if we can even abide each other, much less love each other, like Jesus told us. Before the end of the week, a friend will betray Jesus. And before the end of the week, uh, another friend will deny Jesus. And then all the rest of his friends will abandon Jesus. And then soldiers will invade his place of prayer and drag him off to be arrested and crucified. No, it's not Easter 
Thursday night, we will come into this room and we'll share the Last Supper. And we will once again receive the body and the blood as a remembrance to God's great sacrifice to us. But at the end of the service, we'll, we'll take the cloths off the altar table. We'll take away the candles that are there. We'll strip all the pyramids from the church and we'll leave it bare and dark because it's not Easter. We'll come back on Good Friday. We'll come back on Good Friday and we'll hear again the last words of Jesus and we will think about them and we will leave in silence because it's not Easter. We remember the Good Friday and we're never sure exactly why we call it good. Holy Friday might be a better name, but we remember that day because it was on that day that Jesus was there on the cross and, and the religious leaders, the ones who should have been listening to what he said, those leaders are out there shouting at Jesus, save yourself while he hangs on the cross. One of the criminals that's there with him will, will do the same thing. He'll shout for the whole crowd to hear, save yourself and me. The soldiers will shout, save yourself if you're really a king. And we may even put those words into our own mouth. Save yourself, Lord, and me. No, nope. it's not Easter at all. John Milton, who's a very famous uh, Christian poet, struggled with this same thing. You see, we have trouble talking about uh, the suffering of Jesus, because when we start talking about the suffering of Jesus, what we tend to do is we don't know how to deal with that, so we start comparing it to our suffering, to those things that have troubled us in our lives and those things that, that have overwhelmed us in our lives, and, and we find ourselves continually looking back at ourselves and not at Jesus. John Milton tried to do that. He wrote three poems, or he tried to write three poems. The first one was called On the Morning of the Nativity of Christ. The second one is called On the Circumcision, which is a strange thing to write a poem about. But he managed to do it. And the third one was to be called The Crucifixion. Of Christ. John Milton, as you know, was not a person who wrote short poems. They were epic poems of tremendous thought and, and great words, and yet he could only write eight stanzas of the poem about the crucifixion, and he realized when he had written those eight stanzas that he wasn't talking about Jesus, he was talking about himself. He was talking about his own suffering in life, and he was talking about his own guilt and his own feelings. And that poem sat for 15 years with a little note at the end that he was not capable of writing a poem about the sufferings of Jesus. So 
So what do we do? We can do what the church has done a lot, and, and that is to come up with reasons, to try to think of some reason why Jesus had to die. We call those theories of atonement, and there are several of them. I want to make sure that I get them right. So I want to talk about several of the theories of atonement. There are seven, by the way. The earliest was written by the early church fathers, and, and basically it's called the ransom theory. Because we as individuals, as, as a group of people as a whole, have sinned against God, then we owe God a ransom. Or maybe it's that we owe the ransom to the devil so he'll let us go. But either way, what Jesus did on the cross, according to the early church fathers, was to pay the ransom so that we can go free. The next one in history is called the Recapitulation Theory. It was written by Irenaeus in the second century. And basically what he does is he understands that Jesus, like Paul said, is the new Adam. And Adam messed everything up, along with Eve, by the way. And, and they messed everything up. And because of them, we are all sentenced to die. So Irenaeus says that Jesus came and died even though he was pure so that he could redo all the things that Adam and Eve had undone. The third one is called the satisfaction theory. Anselm of Canterbury came up with this in the 12th century, that the atonement was not a ransom like the early fathers said uh, to God or to the devil, but rather a debt paid to God by Jesus on behalf of us sinners. A debt that we have racked up against God for all of the centuries and Jesus paid it once and for all. The next one I have to read, it, it has two names. The original name was the penal substitution theory, but we now know it as substitutionary atonement. The reformers like Calvin and um, other reformers of his day believe that Christ died for man in man's place, therefore taking their sin and bearing them for himself. The bearing of man's sin takes the punishment for them and sets the believers free on, of the demands of the law. And the righteousness of the law and the holiness of God are therefore satisfied by this substitution. There are more. But the point of this sermon and the point of this worship service is not so that I can test you next week and see if you understand the, the correct theories of atonement and that you can express them. It's to tell you the story of a God who loves you. Of a God who loves you so much that, that he would make sure that his love was greater than any sin that we ever committed. That you can know a God who will hear you and respond to you and take away your fear, just like in Psalm 34, 4, a God who will be present with you in everyday life, who will experience with you disappointment and grief and love and friendship and forgiveness and sacrifice. 
right there with you, a God who will be willing to walk with you even into the valley of the shadow of death and will take away your fear there because God has already been there. And he knows the end of the story. A God whose steadfast love endures forever. In the Philippians passage, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, we hear a wonderful hymn of the church, maybe one of the earliest hymns that was ever written in the church, and I, and I wish I knew the tune that went with it. Beautiful words about how Jesus, who could have claimed to be God, let that go so that that he would humble himself and let his divineness, divinity, sorry, flow out so that he would die upon the cross so that we could be set free. You see, that's where I think it, it really should go, not, not to uh, definitions of theories of atonement, but back to hymns, hymns that lead us to know that there is joy to be had, that, that it may not be Easter yet, but Easter is coming, that we still have to walk through the times of denial and betrayal and, and all the other things, and, and we're going to live in a world that's filled with darkness at times, and there will be times when it feels like Jesus isn't here with us because we've sent him to the cross so many times. But Easter is coming. And then we'll remind ourselves by telling each other the story again and by, by telling the story to people who need to know and to remind them that Easter is coming and that God's steadfast love endures forever. This week, remind yourself of that. Tell that story to yourself each day. And then if you get a chance, tell it to somebody else. Tell it to them, and if they don't hear you the first time, tell it to them again that God's steadfast love for them endures forever. Amen.
We started this service with Psalm 118. It ends, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. As you go out into the world this week, wherever that is, if you need to spend some time alone, I encourage you, pick up your Bible, go to the Gospel of Luke, Go to the Gospel of Luke and read the passages from chapter 19 to, to the end. And hear once again the good news of Jesus Christ. The truth is, in, in Luke's Gospel, there aren't any hosannas and hallelujahs. Because I guess Luke had a, a darker view of the world than Matthew did. But if you need to talk to somebody, if there's something in your life that you need to, to lift up to God and say, is there anything you can do with this? I promise you that God not only can, but will. Please feel free to uh, email us at the church. You can just do church at Burks dot org, B-U-R-K-S dot org. And we will get back in touch with you, or you can call us at the church. You can go on our website and get all that information for how to do that. If you need to talk to somebody, if you need to be reminded that God's love is sure and steadfast forever, then please call. And may your heart be filled with the joy of the knowledge that Easter is coming. Amen.